Chapter 8. Le Professeur. Paris, France, early May, 1989. From its watchful post on the centuries-darkened stone exterior high above the western entrance to the University of Paris, the weathered face of the ancient clock looked down solemnly on Place de la Sorbonne. Its hands stood at 1147. Already the sidewalk tables of the Brasserie, Salon de Thé, and Grillade along the south side of the small square were crowded, though it was still too early for most of the business clientele. Students hunched over their drinks and conversed with great gusto in small groups, four or five around a tiny table made to accommodate two, saying very little about their studies but contending earnestly and at times heatedly about politics and human rights, as though the fate of the world hinged upon their sagacious pronouncements. One outside table at Brasserie L'Escolier, a restaurant that specialized in Carlsberg and Dortmunder beers, had been occupied since mid-morning by two men in business attire. Muscular and tanned, they looked more like professional athletes than entrepreneurs. They exchanged little conversation. A certain restlessness and an occasional glance around the square as they thumbed disinterestedly through the morning edition of Le Monde suggested that they were waiting for someone. When the hands of the clock moved past twelve, the two men seemed to grow increasingly alert and glanced more frequently over the tops of their papers toward the door below the ancient timepiece. At about ten minutes past noon, after the flood of departing students had thinned, a lone figure exited the door and was greeted by the uniformed attendant standing outside with a hearty, Bonjour, professeur. The professor responded with a nod and a brief smile, took a few steps to his right along the narrow Rue de la Sorbonne, then turned abruptly to angle across the square in the direction of Boulevard Saint-Michel. One of the two occupants of the table stood to his feet and moved casually along parallel to the professor, while the other continued to peruse his newspaper for another few moments. At last, he folded his well-thumbed copy of Le Monde, directed a few quiet words into his inside pocket, then joined the procession. As for the man now being shadowed, the passage of years had added a quiet projection of mature wisdom that was befitting a professor at France's most prestigious university. Time had, of course, taken its inevitable toll. Although the unforgettable deep-set brown eyes still seemed to take in everything within sight in one sweeping glance, the once thick, jet-black curly hair was now slightly thinned and streaked with gray. Yet his face seemed hardly to have aged perhaps because it retained that same intense expression of one driven by a consuming cause, with little time to waste on anything else. Even the loose-fitting tweed jacket couldn't hide the fact that the man who wore it was in top physical condition. With every movement, he seemed to exude the explosive energy of one twenty years his junior, as much an athlete in disguise as the two younger men who were now intent upon keeping him closely in view. Anyone who had known Ari at the time of his escape from East Berlin at age 20 would have had little trouble recognizing him now, in spite of his new identity, as Professor Hans Müller, at 45 the well-liked and respected head of the Department of Political Science at the Sorbonne. Twenty-five years had passed since Ari had so mysteriously disappeared from East Germany. At that time, very few who cared had suspected that he'd had the good fortune to escape. Most of those who had been close to him had been quickly swallowed up by the Stasi, never to be heard of again. It was quite naturally assumed that Ari had suffered the same fate. His foster mother, however, had never given up hope. Unfortunately, by the time Ari had felt it was safe to write to her, she was dead, the victim of a brain tumor that mercifully took her quickly. Her husband, consumed by guilt that his periodic fits of violent abuse had contributed to her untimely death, sought increasingly to drown his remorse in alcohol. Not long after her demise, that tragic figure succumbed to cirrhosis of the liver, still awaiting official recognition for the information he'd supplied that surely must have led to the arrest of that Jew-bastard enemy of the state. Ari's letter to his foster mother, written in carefully guarded language, was eventually returned by the censors. They had opened and read it without understanding its significance. A subsequent letter, mailed hopefully some months later, was sent back unopened. 
Across the front were the words, in the handwritten scrawl of the village postmaster, Address C. Deceased. He would never learn the circumstances of her death. The last days of the only mother he'd ever known would remain forever hidden behind the same sinister cloud of totalitarian oppression that obscured the fate of his real parents. That impenetrable veil, woven by the great evil that had left Europe in ruins, allowed Ari to maintain in his own mind the hollow denial that he was not Jewish. After all, that accusation had only come from two uneducated people and was impossible to verify. Nor had he given the painful circumstantial evidence that his parents had been swallowed up in Hitler's Holocaust more than a passing thought for years. The uncomfortable question of his true origin, uneasily laid to rest, had long since been submerged by the rising flood of swiftly moving events that commanded every waking thought. The irreplaceable list of contacts Ari had brought out of the East in that official police briefcase, plus thousands of subsequently acquired ones throughout the Western world and Asia, had been meticulously screened and nurtured by an internationally dispersed staff that he had personally recruited and trained. The process had taken many years, but one of the greatest lessons he had learned from his earlier failures behind the Iron Curtain had been the absolute necessity of patience, and more patience. Revolutions couldn't be rushed. They had to ripen. And within the patience, his vision had grown so that now at last he was within a few months of pulling off, on a worldwide scale, what he had so narrowly missed accomplishing within the limited confines of East Germany. Though founded by Robert de Sorbonne in 1253, the institute that bore his name had its origins in the school that Charlemagne had opened for Alcuin in 8780. That venerable institution became the University of Paris, eventually known as the Sorbonne. It was here, by the end of the 13th century, that most modern university customs, including the writing and defense of theses, the issuance of degrees, academic regalia, and rituals such as commencement exercises all had their origins. With its early history of radicalism and unrivaled reputation as the chief center of education for all of Europe as far back as 1116, under that arch-radical Pierre Abelard, the Sorbonne was the ideal base of operations for Ari's worldwide student revolution. In the classes he taught, Ari could openly advocate, should he care to, the overthrow of existing governments, both in the East and West, without so much as an eyebrow being raised. Publicly, he aggressively promoted a position that was extreme enough to make him popular with students and faculty alike, but did not betray his true ambitions and plans. Such public radicalism in his position as head of the Sorbonne's political science department was the ideal cover for the real revolution Ari was pursuing in secret. His fame as a brilliant debater and captivating public speaker had opened to him the doors of Europe's major universities on both sides of the Iron Curtain, providing Ari with university-sponsored travel and endless contacts throughout the world of academia. Ari had remained an avowed enemy of religion, that great opiate of the people, the only tenet of Marxism to which he still subscribed, it was ironic that the university where he taught had in its early days been intimately linked with the theological school at the nearby cathedral of Notre Dame, and theology was still a major factor in its huge Sciences des Religions department. Oddly enough, however, that department, in attempting to blend science and religion, had destroyed both and now sheltered more skeptics than believers. Ari relished pointing out such contradictions. In 1431, the eminent theologians at the Sorbonne, by that time Europe's foremost center of theology and chief supporter of the papacy, played a major role in the Church's condemnation of Joan of Arc to the stake. Yet inside the Cathedral of Notre Dame, one of the most popular statues, with a large number of candles always burning before it, was that of Saint Jean d'Arc, now France's national heroine. Nor had the Sorbonne itself escaped the plague of contradictions. Always a seething cauldron of revolution, the University of Paris had been shut down when the French Revolution abolished all French universities on September 15, 1793. As Ari often pointed out in his lectures, revolutions too often established worse systems than the ones they replaced, the Soviet Union being a prime example. 
He was determined that the uprising he would lead would not repeat such errors. That was reason enough for him to maintain total control and impenetrable secrecy. Most university students, in Ari's estimation, had no sense of direction and little motivation for changing themselves, much less the world. He had proven that in 16 years of teaching. And the vast majority, unfortunately, no matter how sophisticated they considered themselves to be, would, in the final analysis, follow any leader who knew how to put the ring in their noses and lead them along. There was a dangerous minority who were simply rebels and would join any movement that opposed those in power, then turn against the new government they had helped to establish. Of course, there was always a small number of activists, some very sincere. Their activism, however, was confined to poorly planned, sporadic, and ineffective protests, and scrawling graffiti, most of which was unintelligible and only alienated the general populace. At that very moment, the statue of Auguste Comte that dominated the small square was being sandblasted to remove spray-painted initials that probably belonged to some obscure extremist student group. But who would know? What a waste of effort on both sides, for as soon as it was taken off, the graffiti would reappear. And why was the workman carrying right on during the noon break? He couldn't be a Frenchman. As Ari detoured around the statue, some of the wet, sandy spray blown by the breeze hit him in the face. He wiped it off in disgust and hurried on. Auguste Comte, another contradiction. This founder of sociology, a term he had invented, was a complete failure in his business, his personal life, and his relationships with others. A suicidal, megalomaniac, Comte couldn't even hold a job. Yet his theories heavily influenced 19th century thought and were still being honored, studied, and taught, not only at the Sorbonne, but worldwide. Though an atheistic humanist, Comte had also fallen prey to religious delusions, founding the religion of humanity, with its elaborate rituals, hymns, saints, even canonizing his favorite mistress, Clotilde de Vaux. Human folly seemed endless. Was there any hope? Leadership, that's what it boils down to. The rabble will follow anyone, anything, anywhere. We've got to destroy present leadership structures, not just in the East, but in the West as well, before we can make a new world of freedom and justice. As he reached the sidewalk and turned to follow Boulevard Saint-Michel toward the Seine, Ari's thoughts were interrupted by a voice in his ear and a hand on his arm. Would you sign our petition, Professor? He paused and turned a smile at the speaker, whom he recognized as one of his most serious graduate students. The young Iranian, who had been hurrying to catch up with him as he crossed the square, thrust in front of Ari a large picture album and began to turn its pages, revealing photos of current public executions in Iran and apparent documentation of the most barbarous torture imaginable. These are just a few examples, the young man explained earnestly. Look how the ruling Muslim elite treats not just dissidents, but anyone at random. People are falsely accused, condemned in mock trials, tortured to death without a public hearing. Another young Iranian student had moved on to the center of the sidewalk and was holding high a placard on which was scrawled in large letters, Khomeini est mort, mais les crimes de son régime continuent à être commis. What you really want is not just my signature, but a contribution, right? commented Ari dryly after glancing at the form. Yes, of course, we're trying to raise money to help these poor people. Ari looked him squarely in the eye. I don't doubt the atrocities, but how do I know this organization is legitimate? You know me from class. I wouldn't be involved if maybe you're deceived too. Ari signed the petition and handed the young man a ten-franc coin. I want to have the full documentation on this organization, in writing, and you are to give an oral report to the Justice in Government class. If it's legitimate, then this information needs to be publicized widely, and everyone ought to give to this cause. If it's not legitimate... He left that question hanging and turned to walk briskly along Boulevard Saint-Michel, heading ever deeper into the Latin Quarter. It was a day of rare and dazzling clarity, without a trace of the choking smog that had been growing steadily worse in recent years. So often it settled in mercilessly for days at a time during the heat of summer, 
The sidewalks were crowded with both tourists and Parisians savoring the sun and the overpowering aroma of assorted spring blossoms wafting on the air. Ari glanced at his watch and quickened his pace as he hurried past Musée de Cluny with its visible ruins of Roman baths dating back to the 3rd century. Crossing Boulevard Saint-Germain, he turned right to Rue Saint-Jacques, then left along the narrow street between the ancient churches of saint Severin and saint julien du pauvre Saint this and saint that, there was no way to escape the saints in Paris. Their pervasive presence always reminded him of his East German mama. She would have loved it here if she had only survived long enough and could have come to visit him. There was the wall, but they might have let her out to save the money of supporting another old woman. She would have been happy surrounded by so many saints and absolutely ecstatic inside the Cathedral of Notre Dame de Paris dedicated to Our Lady of Paris. A momentary wave of nostalgia swept over Ari. He had a love for Germany and for that village, and even for that miserable farm in spite of the painful memories. There was something about home and the presence of a woman. His obsessive dedication to the liberation of communist countries, the growing worldwide organization he secretly directed, the continual travel, the clandestine meetings all over Europe, all of that on top of being a professor at the Sorbonne, and department chairman as well, had left no time for anything else. Ari's daily experience had been devoid of all that was sentimental, intimate, or tender, until Nicole had entered his life six years earlier. She had exposed and then filled the aching vacuum he had refused to admit was there. For him, the old adage had proved true. Life had indeed begun at forty. Life and love as he'd never imagined it could be. A pre-med major, Nicky had been in only one of his classes, and they had found themselves irresistibly attracted to each other from the first day. She'd been a top student, sharp, politically savvy, outspoken, and vulnerable to his virile masculinity. Her youth and enthusiasm had rekindled a flame that Ari had thought extinct. Her compassion and understanding, despite the 17-year age difference, had at last defined the word home once again for Ari. Indeed, had given it new meaning. Now in residency as a neurosurgeon at a nearby hospital, she had shared his apartment from the moment they'd fallen in love. Six incredible years. Ari savored the thought for a brief moment, then put it out of his mind. He had to be mentally prepared for the serious and dangerous business ahead. Turning right at the Seine and checking the exact time on his watch again, Ari slowed his pace to stroll along the left bank past its tiny kiosks ingeniously attached to the wall bordering the river. Locked up at night, they were now unfolded, with lids propped up high and astonishing amounts of wares exposed within and displayed on the pavement outside under the watchful eyes of each proudly independent owner. This was capitalism in its simplest, purest form. The narrow sidewalk was jammed with tourists pausing here and there to finger an ancient volume or glance at a clever political cartoon or other bit of the flotsam and jetsam of printed matter that had somehow come to be the peculiar product offered here. Timing himself carefully, Ari turned left to cross the Seine over Pont au Double to Ile de la Cité. He paused to curse the endless lines of tour buses converging there, belching dark clouds of foul-smelling poisonous fumes as they stopped to disgorge or swallow up their cargo of tourists. And he took another moment, face uplifted, hand sheltering eyes from sun, to peer up at the massive Gothic façade of Notre Dame for at least a thousandth time. The repulsive, bird-beaked, evil-eyed, rodent-eared gargoyles with human torsos and arms were perched everywhere on the cathedral, and were another contradiction that held a peculiar fascination for him. If such a place as hell existed, then these monsters surely represented its denizens. Demons stationed on the parapets of a church to protect it from evil? Talk about the fox guarding the hen house. Yet the same contradiction was repeated endlessly in governments around the world, where the so-called welfare of the people was in the hands of leaders who cared only for themselves. His life was devoted to eventually replacing what he called the government gargoyles, beginning with Marxist regimes 
and not sparing the West, from Paris to Washington. Given over to momentary disgust, Ari moved on another hundred feet toward Pont d'Arcole. The perpetual hordes of visitors always milling about the cathedral made this a good meeting point. One could get lost in the crowds. Of course, they followed him everywhere he went and knew every move he made. It was for his own protection, or so he was told when he complained. Sometimes he caught a glimpse of his guardians, as he had of those two today when he'd come out of the university, but usually he saw nothing. He just knew, even now, as he stood on the curb across the street from the front entrance of the massive 13th century cathedral, that somewhere in the crowd close by was the security he had not asked for, didn't want, and certainly didn't trust. He was an expert at losing them when he wanted to, but that only made the committee angry and created more tensions. Ari glanced at his watch again and waited. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw a cab slowing. That was his signal. A quick wave of an arm, a dash between the parked cars into the street as it came to a stop, and he was inside. The back seat was already occupied by a tall, lean, well-dressed man with sharp features and a self-possessed air. He could have been German, French, Dutch, a true international who could fit in anywhere and spoke eight languages fluently with flawless accent. No one would have suspected that he was from, of all places, Texas, until he spoke English. Except for a trace of gray in his crew-cut blonde hair and a few new creases across his forehead, Roger Dunn's physical appearance had changed little since Ari had first met him in East Berlin twenty-six years before. Without so much as a flicker of recognition, as though he were a total stranger, Ari greeted his fellow passenger in French with a hearty, "'Thanks for sharing the cab.' To the driver, he added, "'Tour Eiffel.' "'Tour Eiffel,' returned the cabbie. 